Lives of the Unconscious. A podcast on psychoanalysis and psychotherapy. Episode 24. The Concepts of Contemporary Psychoanalysis. Even though psychoanalysis is still primarily equated with the work of Sigmund Freud in some places, since its beginnings more than 120 years ago, it has undergone many developments and differentiated itself into a multitude of schools and currents that are taught and practiced all over the world. In today's episode, we will try to give an overview of the contemporary concepts of psychoanalysis whereby we will focus on psychoanalysis as a therapeutic method of healing. In this, however, we do not want to overlook the fact that psychoanalysis is not only a psychotherapeutic method, but rather a science and way of thinking in its own right, that is influential in many disciplines and spheres of society, from pedagogy and forensics, to art, literature, or philosophy. While it is easy to refute the cliché of the dusty old method of therapy, in which the therapist sits behind the couch and remains silent, or wants to talk exclusively about the Oedipus complex, a glimpse into the practice of a psychoanalyst would be sufficient. It is difficult to say what exactly contemporary psychoanalysis is. Psychoanalysis is a matter of international concern, from Taiwan to Lebanon to Uruguay. Psychoanalysis is practiced in almost every country on earth, and the same issues are not relevant in every society. In a society characterized by political repression, patriarchal family structures, and the repression of sexuality, or in which religious ties play a significant role, quite different questions are likely to arise with regard to mental suffering than, say, in a society that draws its experience of identity primarily from perceived self actualization or from success as defined in terms of the economic competition of individuals. For Western societies, it could perhaps be said that the development of psychoanalytic treatments in recent decades cannot be considered independently of the liberalization of sexuality, the transformation of traditional family structures, and, without a doubt, also the digitalization and economization of new spheres of life. As we heard in episode 8, on the effectiveness of psychoanalytic procedures, there is a multifaceted international research landscape in which new therapeutic concepts are constantly being developed. Treatment techniques and settings have evolved and sometimes changed significantly, resulting in a multiplicity of different approaches, some of which we will hear about in a moment. There is no such thing as a static psychoanalysis that, regardless of the patient's particular set of problems and personality, is simply administered. Psychoanalysis is not just a prefabricated procedure that can be applied, but rather always something individual that arises within the particularity of the encounter between therapist and patient. Today, one might speak of tailor-made psychotherapy, a psychotherapy customised to the patient, although this is understood quite differently by each respective technique. Nevertheless, in the following we will try to outline some of the paths of development within modern psychoanalysis that are perhaps characteristic for many contemporary methods. One from one mind psychology to relational work. Two, from the past to the here and now. Three, from openness to goal directedness. Four, from uncovering 
to structural formation. We would like to consider the points in detail, thereby taking a closer look at individual contemporary treatment approaches, namely relational psychoanalysis, mentalization-based therapy methods, and work with so-called early disorders. 1. From one mind psychology to relational work. This constitutes, perhaps, the most important tendency within contemporary psychoanalysis. Whereas in classical forms of psychoanalysis, the focus was on the inner world of the analysands, the conflicts they have with themselves, perhaps even with their own biology, the drives. Today, it is the work in the therapeutic relationship that is understood as the heart of psychoanalytic technique. It is about the inner world in relation to others. The therapist is not a blank silent screen onto which the analysand projects inner conflicts, nor the external observer of inner processes, guiding the analysand's introspection and speaking from a position of knowledge but rather a participant in the therapeutic encounter. The therapeutic process and the development of the psyche take place through the relational experience of emotions that the analysand has in their encounter with the therapist. As a result, the role of therapists changes fundamentally. They must become more tangible available as a relational figure, a person who makes themselves available, whereby, here, the degree of involvement is assessed differently by the respective schools. Important milestones in this development are the so-called intersubjective as well as relational psychoanalysis, which were conceptualised in the USA in the 1990s, and from which they have had a strong impact. Significant contemporary authors here include Stephen Mitchell, Robert Stollero, George Atwood, and Nancy Chodoro. The intersubjective paradigm in psychoanalysis is based on the principle that self-experience, one's own identity, must be thought of primarily in terms of interpersonal relationships. We become that which we are through relationships and in relationships. Thus, it is not that we enter into relationships with others, with some already fixed self. What we are only emerges to some degree at the moment of the relationship and can be shaped through this relationship. Certain aspects of self come into resonance with the social situation, or simply don't. This way of thinking can perhaps be illustrated by the phenomenon of the class reunion. It may be 10 or 20 years since graduation. We have long since become someone else, have overcome many insecurities since our school days, have matured in many respects. If we meet with old classmates at a class reunion decades later, we are suddenly thrust back into old roles, even subjectively feel those old insecurities, as if, at least for the course of the evening, we had changed or spontaneously regressed. The reason is that we have turned up in an old intersubjective field, the school class, in which, for all those involved, certain interpersonal patterns are reconstituted, which also impart to us a very specific sense of self. Through a drastic change of the intersubjective field, our self has also been constituted anew. If we leave this situation, we again experience a different sense of self. Of course, 
There is also the converse positive case. The year abroad, in which we have suddenly become someone else. The self changes along with its relationships, which, by the way, is also true over the course of a single day. At work, we are someone else than at home, and so on. To be stuck in an experience of the self that has very adverse consequences means above all being stuck in certain relational patterns. Say, finding oneself back in this school situation time and time again, even once the school days are long over. Other aspects of the self, such as an extroverted nonconformist part, do not arise in relationship with others, do not find resonance, are in this sense disassociated, which amounts to a disintegration of one's own self and ultimately leads to psychological suffering. The extent to which there are solidified inner structures that are formed on the basis of our previous experiences, regulating our perception and behaviour in such situations, is treated differently by the various approaches. The key to change, however, is always the intersubjective field of therapy. The therapist does not unlock the inner world of the analysand through interpretations. Rather, the analysand and the analyst jointly develop a relational space in which new experiences become possible, say, by finding resonance with those parts of the self that previously had been completely cut off from realisation. Making sense of what transpires is, of course, necessary for any progress. And that means, above all, understanding the unconscious dynamics involved. For example, the latent assumptions and assignments of roles as when the analysand appears to automatically resort to the role of the one who is clueless, helpless, and assigns the analyst the role of the one who is the knowledgeable, powerful. This asymmetry in the relationship should be the immediate subject of conversation and should be overcome in that the analysand and the analyst come up with a way of being together that is possible without this fixed assignment of roles. 2. From the past to the here and now. This development is related to the tendency to focus therapeutic attention, not on the past, but on the here and now of the therapeutic relationship. It is not so much that something from the past is uncovered in therapy, as something new is created. For therapeutic work, the past is important primarily in so far as it concerns a reactualized past, patterns from experience that still significantly shape today's relationships and therefore also become tangible within the space of a therapy. A solidified inner expectation may have originated in childhood. For example, the feeling that one's needs were overlooked by one's caregivers. As a pattern of interpersonal experience, however, it also becomes significant in the therapeutic relationship. Be it in the feeling that the therapist cannot help, or it may be in the longing to finally be seen, combined with great fears of losing the therapist. In therapy, it is important to talk about past experiences in order to understand oneself better. Above all, however, it is important to recognise the repeating pattern in the here and now of the therapeutic relationship.
and to open up space for a new experience with the therapist, such as the growing feeling that it is possible to enter into relationships with others after all, or to endure separateness without feeling helpless and at the mercy of others. 3. From openness to goal directedness. Another tendency of many contemporary therapeutic approaches is to channel and formalize the therapeutic procedure more strongly. The classical method of psychoanalysis is thematically open, keyword free association, and is, in principle, without a time limit, a process that is supposed to find its way and reach a goal of its own accord, so long as the analysand can afford it in terms of time and money. However, as a psychotherapy method, say, within a system of statutory health insurance, modifications already have been made. There is a limitation to the number of sessions, with the therapeutic work directed above all at the treatment of the mental illness. One also speaks of a so-called curative analysis versus a classical self-awareness analysis. Nevertheless, a certain thematic openness and the absence of acute time pressure that isn't guided by directives can still be important for an emotionally genuine interpersonal encounter, not to mention for psychological development and processes of self-awareness. For the treatment of certain mental illnesses, however, it has proven important in many cases to structure the therapeutic procedure more strongly in advance, especially when patients can hardly establish or maintain structures internally, as is often the case with so-called borderline disorders, or when the own inner world is so overwhelming that an open emotional encounter can be frightening or devastating as is the case with pronounced trauma sequelae disorders. In these cases, it becomes important for the therapeutic approach to provide a structured framework and tangible tools or to proceed in an educational manner, for example, by explaining certain psychological connections explicitly as an example, in psychodynamic imaginative trauma therapy, certain therapeutic techniques are used at the start to establish a basis for overcoming dissociation and approaching trauma in a structured way. Also, mentalization-based therapy, dynamic interpersonal therapy for severe depression, or structure-based psychotherapy are all techniques based on psychoanalytical methods that are pre-structured and more goal-oriented. Here, there are also so-called therapy manuals, more or less specific instructions, so to speak, in which the therapeutic procedure is systematically described. The therapy is divided into certain phases, and a set of therapeutic interventions is described. We would like to take mentalization based therapy as an example. This therapeutic approach is often recommended for structural disorders, in which regulating affects and thinking about them present difficulties, such as with borderline disorders or disorders in social behaviour, impulsive aggressiveness or delinquency. Mentalization-based therapy methods can be used in very different settings, depending on whether they are outpatient or inpatient. Typically, they take place in the context of a designated number of hours or period of time, say 18 months 
which can also be extended if necessary. Here, individual therapy sessions and group therapy are combined. And this, too, usually involves psychoeducational sessions. The goal is to help patients achieve better control of behaviour and affects by stimulating certain thought processes. This involves thinking about one's own emotions and the emotional states of others, which ultimately means mentalising, by which a piece of mental space is built, thinking, instead of acting. The therapist tries to stimulate reflection and curiosity about one's own and other people's mental states through certain questioning techniques, such as through challenging, posing playful, friendly and humorous questions about seemingly self-evident relations, or also by the therapist bringing in his or her own perspectives and feelings. Is this really unimportant? I would get pretty angry. The focus of therapy is on the patient's affective states and repeatedly becomes the subject of the conversation. How do I feel? How do I think the other person felt? What consequences did that have? The therapist does not lecture the patient about what is going on inside, but tries to understand, on an equal footing, what emotional processes of change are taking place. The therapist tries to keep the patient in the realm of mentalising, that is, to maintain a state of affect in which the patient can still think about themselves without being flooded by their affects. When this happens, the therapist and patient try to return to the last point where mentalising was still possible. The group sessions are, in a sense, a training ground for interpersonal encounters, in which patients get feedback from other patients about how others feel or understand certain situations. At the end of the therapy, the patient should, if possible, have gained something in their ability to self-regulate and to mentally integrate affects. We talked about the scientific background of mentalization theory in episode 6. Mentalization-based therapies are an example of a very structured approach. However, even in less pre-structured approaches to therapy, modern psychoanalysis is indeed still more strongly directed towards a goal. Combinations are also possible. For instance, using therapeutic techniques at the beginning of the treatment that involve a more structured approach in order to cope with certain acute difficulties, like dissociations, or a severe avoidant, aggressive, or self-injurious behaviour. And then, if applicable, following this with a more open technique, in order to catch up on certain mental development. This tendency is certainly also the result of the success that the techniques of behavioural therapy have had within psychotherapy landscape over recent decades. And without a doubt, economic necessities, such as limited financial resources in the healthcare system, also play a role here. 4. From uncovering to structural formation For the last path of development, we want to describe a change in therapeutic technique that is decisive for contemporary psychoanalysis in a unique way. Therapeutic approaches have been developed for disorders that were previously considered virtually untreatable, such as personality pathologies like borderline or narcissism, or even psychotic disorders 
These therapies, however, are usually less concerned with uncovering unconscious conflicts than with building up mental structure. Long-term psychoanalytical therapies, in particular, are often concerned with working on so-called early disorders, which are related to the early development of the ego. We've already heard about this in episode 12 on structural disorders. Uncovering unconscious conflicts, restructuring one's own childhood and life history, and integrating them into one's own identity. These are psychological achievements that assume an already consolidated ego and the integration of a particular capacity for thought. It requires the ability to establish inner connections, to relate thoughts and feelings. At the centre of this inner mental space is the symbolic use of language, which establishes a meaningful self-reference along the lines of What is the meaning of what I say? What is the meaning of what others say? What does one have to do with the other? In this context, psychoanalyst and infant researcher Daniel Stern also speaks of the verbal self, which, in the development of the ego, characterises a later form of self-access. An early disorder means that this ability to integrate, one also speaks of the ability to symbolise, is impaired most notably when strong affects predominate. An example, a patient comes to a therapy session rather livid and utters the sentence, I am furious today. A therapist, according to the classical method, may now try to understand the meaning of what was said by means of a revealing interpretation. For example, by asking, Perhaps this is connected with the last session, in which a difficult topic was addressed. The therapist thus establishes a symbolic connection. The anger is connected to the last session, in which the patient felt very hurt. A has to do with B. The therapist then interprets the meaning of what was said. But it is precisely this kind of connection that those with early disorders find so difficult to make when under the pressure of strong affects. The patient only becomes more upset and says, yeah, maybe, but I'm just simply pissed. Here, speaking is close to doing. Words can only be translated into a symbolic meaning with difficulty. The screaming child who wants to create in others a certain affective state is perhaps exemplary of this, as in, Ouch! That hurts me! Stop talking and help me! If the affective pressure becomes too great, the inner psychic structure may in part collapse, thereby causing them to act rather than speak. The patient can then no longer say, I feel like running away today, because then he actually does run away, doesn't come back to therapy, or the like. In psychoanalysis, we also speak of acting out, the expression of feelings in actions, a mode of thought that we have already heard about in episode 9 on dramaturgic awareness. Instead of offering a symbolic interpretation of the patient's expression of anger, the therapist, in our example, might instead say, Yes, I can tell. You're angry today. One can see in this case that the therapist brings much more of themselves and their feelings into play, responds on a concrete level by marking the patient's feelings thus making it clear 
I understand. Your feelings have gotten through. You're angry. The patient thus has the experience in their relationship with the therapist of being understood emotionally. Perhaps this calms him or her down. And as things continue, it becomes possible to reflect a bit on the meaning of anger, i.e. to enlarge mental space. Work with early disorders has brought about multiple changes in therapeutic technique, which often deviate considerably from the classical technique. Say, for example, in the school of Wilfred Bayern and his successors, but also in modern psychotherapeutic approaches or mentalization based therapy methods. We have touched here on only some of the important concepts of contemporary therapy. In addition, there is a wide field of other significant contemporary currents, such as modern variants of so-called self-psychology or object relations theory. As for contemporary therapy approaches, such as transference-focused psychotherapy, psychodynamic interpersonal psychotherapy, structure-based therapy methods, or analytic group psychotherapy, we will have to deal with these another time. As much as psychoanalysis has profited from these new approaches and has differentiated and refined its treatment technique, it is perhaps also still important that psychoanalytical thinking retains a moment of resistance, non-conformism, perhaps even, something somewhat out of step with the times. Indeed, perhaps even a place that is valuable and healing, precisely because it cannot be entirely functional or efficient, an individual refuge of one's very own that resists calculation and is thus a place of freedom. Contemporary is a word with positive connotations. To be sure, it also describes the necessity to avoid invalidation. Yet herein also lies something ideological. A thing is not good only in that it is contemporary. One could almost say that the coercive demand to assimilate to the latest situation, that survival of the fittest that has to be fought out every day anew, has inherent within its own specific social character. It is a form of thought that, at least in its extreme, is modelled on modern competitive capitalism that daily struggle for survival on the market, where only those who constantly adapt to contingent requirements and innovations have a right to exist. Different societies certainly value things in different ways, by, for instance, especially esteeming that which has proven the test of time, or that which creates a bond to previous generations. Perhaps there is also a tendency in many societies today away from the exhaustive struggle for variations on the supposedly new, a weariness with the postmodern constructions of the self, a search for the past, for some reconnection to something that holds true, or, to put it another way, a search for truth in one's own history family, in one's own personal and social life. This need by no means be a stubborn traditionalism that cannot bear difference, but may instead describe a longing for substance, which could still be quite contemporary. It would not be surprising, even in psychoanalysis, if what today is considered outdated is tomorrow very contemporary?
Developments are not a linear timeline of ever greater progress. The beginning and the ending are one. And often enough development, here akin to the structure of great novels and stories, ultimately ends in its source. But then, with the replete and mature knowledge of a journey that lies behind. This podcast was written and produced by Cecile Lutz and Jakob Müller. It has been translated by Suleiman Lawrence and is read by Rebecca Dyson-Smith.